would say, that there is more children being killed than combatants. It is a time for us to stand strong with Israel and to work with Israel in this most difficult era. Cease fire now! 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 Angry! I yes. obey those unlawful orders to deploy to an illegal war. I will not get on that plane. And so I'm looking at possibly two to five years in prison, um, a dishonorable discharge, dismissal from the military, and a loss of all pain allowances during that time. Looking toward developing a military resistance to the government in the pursuit of unjust and illegal and unconstitutional wars uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere around the world. The, the rape and harassment in the military has been going on for a long time through several wars, particularly of women, but also of men, and it's time now that it's stopped. I think we gotta do whatever we have to do to stop this madness, because it it is, just can't go on. Welcome to Mad as Hell TV. As the war on terror rages on into its fifth year, Spurred into bloody action by the calculated events of 9-11, we have to pause and ask ourselves, who benefits from all this bloodletting? It's not the children who are bombed and burned every day in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. It's not the taxpayers who are funding these wars. It's not the young soldiers who are dying and being maimed in their 20s or coming home contaminated by the chemical weapons and the radioactive weapons. We, as the, the death toll rises each day by every minute, we have to stop and ask who benefits and where is the opposition? Well, part of that opposition is here in the studio with us today. Welcome to Mad as Hell TV, Grant Remington of Veterans for Peace. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> So we're, what is the answer to that question, Grant? Who do you think is benefiting from all these wars? Well, I would say, first of all, there's a, a lot of people making money uh, that are benefiting from it. We were warned, of course, about the military-industrial complex, but I think you can also, uh, in the original draft of the speech by Eisenhower, uh, it was his farewell address that warned us of the military-industrial complex. He also had in there media, the military-industrial media complex. So I think it's, it's a combination of moneyed interest, uh, those who wish to force their ideas on other people, 
uh, out of ideological or other reasons I'm, I really couldn't tell you. You know, some of their m reasonings, because it's madness to me, and, and insanity is a hard thing to understand. But mostly it's, uh, it's about money, it's about resources, it's about control. So now, are you a Vietnam vet? That's correct. So how long were you in Vietnam? Just for the one year that we were uh, rotated in and out. Uh -huh. I did not extend my tour. And you, at that time, you weren't forced to extend your tour, as from what I understand. Oh no, we had we had a draft, so it was easy to get more bodies. Ah, uh, I see. Right, I understand. Now you and I talked. You had seen this film called Sir No Sir, and I've also seen it. And I remember I was, you know, one of the protesters in the Vietnam War, and I didn't realize there was such a strong resistance inside the military to the Vietnam War. And when I talked to you even though you were in Vietnam, you didn't realize it either, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, actually, I went through Colleen, Texas uh, twice on my way back and forth um, to Alabama and Georgia when I was stationed there going between Vietnam. Um, and I didn't know about it, and that's where the oleo strut was that was so prominent in that movie. Although a friend of mine who was stationed there said that, with her husband, said that she'd gone there. So I, I didn't know anything about it. So it's just interesting to me that there was such enormous resistance and yet so, so little media coverage about it because they were covering at that time more than they're covering now in terms of bodies being shown and military you know, deaths and casualties. But despite the fact we're still not seeing any resistance and yet it's, it's growing, wouldn't you say? Well, I would think that um, there is an undercurrent of resistance. Um, probably uh, also an undercurrent of resentment uh, that they're being used and abused uh, continuously. And, and I think it's, it's more than just the bottom people. I think that there are some higher level brass that are really not comfortable with what's going on. And I think there's some higher level resistance that we don't hear about that is keeping us from going any more forward than we are. Right. I, for instance, heard a uh, retired colonel uh, McGregor. I don't know if you've heard about him, but he came out here to Portland and spoke, and then I interviewed him, and he's saying that he qu basically retired from the military after being there for like 28 years. It was a career for him, and he felt that it was the way the, the Iraqi war had been staged and no planning, and the fact that he, he also quoted Eisenhower, which you did earlier about the military-industrial complex, and he says there's no, basically no monitoring of the military, the spending. No, there's, in fact, uh, you know, the Pentagon is missing over a trillion dollars. Which uh, is a, it's almost yeah. unbelievable to imagine that much money yeah. being missing. Yeah, no accounting practices that are followed. I mean, everybody else seems to have to live by standard accounting practices except the Pentagon. Exactly. So we really don't know what, we know there are some really high-tech weapons, um, supposedly energy weapons. We know they're using a lot of depleted uranium. And these weapons all have, you know, adverse effects. I just read about someone today who was in Iraq and is now claiming that he has migraines, that he has tumors, that he's really convinced that it's the depleted uranium dust that he inhaled. Yeah, I, I read the same story. Did you? And, and it's uh, he and several others are suing. They the are suing. Yes. Uh huh. Yes, for, now, isn't uh, that what happened in the first Gulf War? They had to take that to court, and they finally did. The government finally did admit that there was such a thing as Gulf War syndrome. Or they've admitted it. They're they're still not uh, certain what the causes are, or they're not releasing uh, what they think the causes are. But right. remember, it took them many, many years for Agent Orange to be recognized as the culprit for all right. of the uh, ills that befell our Vietnam veterans exposed to it. Not only them, but their offspring. Yes, correct. And so do you think there will be an equal or maybe worse uh, damage from the depleted uranium? And Well, I'm, you know, I really can't say because I'm not a, a scientist and environmentalist. All I know is that, that it's not the radioactivity that is the problem, although it is somewhat, but it is a heavy metal just like lead poisoning. That's what plutonium does. It's a heavy metal poisoning and can get in uh, and do damage to all kinds of, of systems in your body. So it's, it's that heavy metal stuff. That's what it's right. about. So 
what I would like to do with this program is to at least show people that there is resistance inside the military. Um, we're going to show a clip pretty soon now of Palestinian and Israelis combatants who've gotten together and decided they're going to work for peace. So this is kind of an historic moment that, as far as I know, it's unprecedented. Yeah, refuseniks. So the refuseniks on the Israeli mm -hmm. side, but there's also now Palestinians yeah. who are also saying they refuse to fight. And so it seems like that is kind of where some hope lies in terms of resistance. And it, one of the things that... Because if the soldiers stop fighting... That's right. There won't be any wars. That's right. Um, one of the things that, that the soldiers have to come to grips with is that they can do it. And that they have to, you know, really look at their conscience and they have to overcome the peer pressures and the, all of the training and brainwashing they've gone through. Um, and that, that's just something that has to be um, introduced to them with the truth and give them more than one, you know, source of information. Uh, when I go to my uh, high schools and teach in classes, um, counter-recruiting is what we do. We, we teach a little history, and I tell them, don't trust authority. Question it, including me. Mm -hmm. If I tell you something, look it up. Find out if I'm telling you the truth. You know, Don't trust what I say, verify, as Ronald right. Reagan would say. Trust, but verify. Well, I think that is, is, I think their programming is to trust their leader, their commander. Well, you don't want to come to the realization that your government has done what it appears they've done. You, you don't want to believe that this could happen. And that's one of the things that, that happened. Uh, they, actually, that's one of the causes of PTSD, uh, or can be one of the causes is of PTSD, is the, is the denial and uh -huh. then the realization and all of a sudden you're like, I got screwed. You know, these people did this thing to me and used me and abused me. Uh, instead of doing it for a good cause, it was not. Mm -hmm. And so then you start having all kinds of questions and cognitive dissonance and what did I do that for? And, right. you know, those kinds of things. It, it uh, goes around and around in your head and you see the images and you remember the smells and the sights and, and what was it for? And that's something that might be even more difficult to treat because it isn't something that's tangible as a some kind of uh, maimed limb would be or yeah. you know, some other physical damage. Yeah. It's just a, a part of the symptoms. Yeah. Right. Um, well we do we will do want to mention a couple um, soldiers who are speaking out now. The first one is Lieutenant Aaron Watada and we have a picture of him. Uh, he is the first commissioned officer to publicly refuse to to Iraq and he's going to be taking those consequences. He's being court-martialed right now I believe mm -hmm. and faces up to eight years in prison. So that's a very courageous act on his part. And following in his footsteps we have a picture of another young man, Sergeant Ricky Closing, and he himself is, is speaking out and is facing uh, court-martial and may also face many years in prison. And we have one more picture I want to show. It's from a rally for Lieutenant Watada that took place up in Fort Lewis, Washington. Well, right outside Fort Lewis. On the overpass. Yeah. At the overpass, yeah. yeah. And there we have the picture of that. And quite a few people showed up for that. So I think he has a fair number of supporters. But it's going to be interesting to see how long that support goes when he is in prison, because that's a long prison term. You know, you are, you are presuming that our justice system, or the military <laughs> justice system. That's right, system, he may not go to prison. May, what am I he saying? He may not, because, well, yes, let, he let might us get... look at, at what he's doing is that he is bringing this uh, in a totally different vein because he is challenging the legality of the whole enterprise. Right. And therefore, um, it's something that the, the military and the Bush administration really has to keep their eye on the ball because this is open. I mean, right. this is an open court, and once discovery is made and he can ask for things for evidence um, and many constitutional scholars have said that this is an illegal war Kofi Annan and so has said it is illegal that. that's correct that's and good. Uh, there is a difference between an officer and an enlisted man's oath the enlisted uh, oath is that you are to obey orders of commander-in-chief and those officers above you 
and to swear and protect, to uphold the, and defend the Constitution of the United States, etc. An officer does not swear to obey the orders of his commander-in-chief. He swears to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is his first duty. So he is not bound to obey George Bush if That's it's an illegal order. That's very interesting. It is. It's a different order. Very oath. interesting. Yeah. In other words, the commissioned officers and the, what do you call it? It's not the infantry. Enlisted. The enlisted men have a different set of um, guidelines well, a different for their oath, service. Yeah. A different oath. A different oath, yeah. Uh, you're, huh. Yeah. So, his, so the he, enlisted men are not instructed to obey the Constitution, no, no, just their commanding no, officer. No, they are, that's their first duty is to the Constitution. I state your name, um, you know, solemnly swear or about, or, uh, about to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to obey the orders of the commander-in-chief and all those officers appointed above me or something like that. But that's not in the officer's oath. So it's a little different. Mm -hmm. So his, he's challenging it on constitutional grounds. And he actually, as a commissioned officer, is the only person who could do that. Well, I think that a, an enlisted man could also, because if it's an illegal order from your commander-in-chief, you know, it's the same deal. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just an interesting point. Yeah. I mean, this, this becomes very interesting in order to uh, for us to see what what will happen in this trial, yeah. I mean, it'll be great if it's open. Do you think this will be an open trial? That it will have to be. It will have to be. They they can't keep this closed. Uh huh. Uh, there will be reporters there, even if there isn't the public allowed. There'll be reporters. They they can't keep a, a lid on this. Well, that's great. That yeah. gives us some. So then, uh, Grant, just tell us what hope do you see? So and, and how many AO? First of all, how many people are AWOL at this point? To you, do you know from Iraq? I don't know. I, I've heard 5,000. Uh, could be 5, more. 5,000? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and that's something we don't really hear too much about. No. Even that figure. Yeah. So there could be a lot more resistance than we're even aware of, of, oh, the, I, I of those so. of us who are looking into it. Yeah. Okay. You know, what? we're going to wrap up here pretty shortly, but tell us what is Veterans for Peace doing and what, what hope do you see? Well, I noticed on the roll-in uh, we had a, a member of Veterans for Peace, probably of the Olympia chapter, mm -hmm. uh, was talking about it. And we give the lieutenant uh, as much support as we can. Uh, we try and inform people uh, that these things are illegal. In fact, uh, Veterans for Peace has been calling for the impeachment of George Bush on a whole bunch of illegal grounds, okay. uh, violation of the Constitution, all kinds of international laws, which are part of the Constitution. Uh, so our, our purpose is to educate, inform, uh, hit the streets, do that kind of thing, uh, go into the schools and educate people, uh, support demonstrations like the one you had mm -hmm. on your roll-in tape, uh, these kinds of things, and counsel. I mean, if, if some guy or girl, gal, excuse me, don't mean to be, you know, mm -hmm. if some enlisted personnel of either uh, gender comes to us and has a question, you know, we will give them as much information as we can without encouraging them. Because we, that's against the law to, mm -hmm. you know, encourage someone to defect or, or go AWOL. So, but we'll give them the information. We'll give them uh, the GA hotline is a good right. place to get information exactly. and their legal stuff. There's the National Lawyers Guild can help them. There's all various organizations out there. We'll point so them to that. So if they go to veteransforpeace.org, that's They're going to find all these links to the GI hotline and so forth. Correct. Great. Yeah. Well, Grant, we're going to have to wrap up right That's now. Fine. The second part of our show, Clyde Lewis is going to interview Doug Wilkins of Americans United for Palestinian Rights. And he's also interviewing Joel, ba let me pronounce his right, Bainan. I, I hope I pronounced that right. And he is going to talk about what's happening in Lebanon. He's a professor of Middle Eastern history at Stanford University and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. But right up, coming up right now, is this first time ever dialogue between Palestinian fighters and Israeli refuseniks. And they're called Combatants for Peace. If we have that roll in ready, we can roll that now. דן פחור מתל אביב, הייתי חודש בכלא. 
أنا وزميلي لي قمنا بفعل جندية نفراليين هذا أدى لاعتقالنا وأنا محكمة كان عمرنا 15 عام محكمة 15 عام وصاحبي محكمة 18 عام أخات شبع بالليل الأخوان شلي ششرات تي بشتخيم أرستي باي كروب مود فو بالخادم بوتو يوم اشتتفتي بجام ببصورة ببوكر وبصورة בכתר, סגר, על כפר חוסן, וראיתי את הילדים הקטנים בגיל של הבת שלי, שנעולים בתוך הכפר הזה, שבעצם הפכנו אותו לבית כלא, ובעוד שאני מסתכל על הילדות האלה, על הילדים הקטנים, על הסוללת הכפר שחוסנת את הכפר, אני מדבר בטלפון עם אשתי, והיא אומרת לי, אל תשאל מה קרה, אין לי מי שיקח את תמר מהגן, את הבת שלנו, וצריך למצוא מי ש... כאילו, היא הזכירה לי את הבת שלי, את הבעיות השגרתיות של היום יום. אז כנראה שגידלו אותי בצורה עם כזאת פרנויה, שכולם רוצים להרוג אותנו, שהייתי צריך להגיע לגיל 32, לראות ילדות פלסטיניות על סוללת עפר, בכפר שאני חוסם אותו, ורק זה... ועוד הבית שהרסנו בלילה גרם לי להבין שה... שהילדות האלה, בצורה הכי עמוקה שאפשר להבין, שהילדות האלה לא באמת שונות מהבת שלי. אז הבנתי שאני לא משתתף בזה יותר, לא משנה מה היה הנושאים שלך. עודד עסקנו על חמש שיעור מנציגים בישראל. מה זה נצטרך מדדה? אני מקום במעקוד היצרובות, עם זדור, עם צפון, עם מכות, אנחנו נדבר בענה ומעבר על סלב מוזיגים הון, בעד סלב מוזיגים הון. بدأنا بتسكيل مركز بالسلام للعائلة المصطفات من مختلفة بعد الرجل لأن احنا بنأمن ان بغير الواقع هم المقاتلين لن تضرروا مباشرة من الصراع كان يداي معمين بكوخ شيش لكل شلانو بتوخ الخبرات شلانو لأفوخ ات كل التعميم هاي لشي خطيتي تكاوى عدوم وعسيتي دوارين شاسور لأسود لماشو شيموتت ات الكيبوش ويفسيك اتو الخبرة الاسرائيلية بتوخ اتسمع تخليط להפסיק את הכיבוש כי זה פשוט התמוטט על היום. אני רק את ההבנה שלי הייתי רוצה לתרגם ביחד עם אנשים מהצד השני, לסמן את הקווים האדומים ביחד איתכם בשתי החברות. Welcome back to Mattis Hell TV. I'm Clyde Lewis, and I'm very pleased today to have with me on the program some very distinguished gentlemen uh, to talk about what's going on in the, in the Middle East. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, discussed earlier uh, before we came on camera to speak to you today is the, the problem that I'm seeing with the whole issue of the Middle East is that uh, it seems to be a script. There seems to be this script that we're on, and it continues. Everybody seems to be following this agenda and this script, and the minute you're off the script, Somebody tells you to get back on script. That means 
get back behind the war, get back and, 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 you know, and cheer on the death and destruction. And, and a lot of people don't even know why we hate certain people and why we're fighting with certain people. The only thing they know is that we're supposed to hate, we're supposed to fight, and this was all told to us in some prophecy somewhere. So get on script. It's the end of the world. Armageddon's just around the corner. So I figured I needed to clear a lot of things up, and I have two wonderful guests tonight. I'd like you to uh, welcome to uh, Mad Cell TV. We have Doug Wilbanks with us today. He's with Americans United for Palestinian Rights. Also with me is Joel Bainan, and he's a professor of Middle Eastern Studies, or Middle Eastern History, rather, at Stanford University. A university and also uh, Jewish Voices for Peace. Gentlemen, welcome to Mattis Hell TV. As I had said earlier, and we, we had talked and we discussed together before we came on this program, I think a lot of people really don't understand uh, Israeli politics, especially people who are not uh, Jewish or not involved directly. We all seem to think we have an idea of what's going on, but we really don't. Uh, could someone, perhaps you, Joel, could you comment on the democracy that is Israel right now? It's pretty complicated because Israel is a democracy if you're Jewish, more or less. Pretty broad range of freedoms in some ways, uh, much freer press and more feisty press than we have in this country. But about 20% of Israel's citizens are Palestinian Arabs, people who are descended from uh, the 100,000 or so who didn't leave when the State of Israel was established in 1948. Those people are citizens. They have political rights. They're elected to the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, and so on. But in all respects, they are discriminated against. So um, their villages don't have as good health care services. They don't have as good educational services. They don't have as good access to water. About half of their agricultural lands were confiscated to make uh, room for new settlements for Jewish immigrants. Uh, their political parties were for many years and still are in some respects uh, closely supervised uh, so that they don't uh, say things that are uh, too sharply anti-Zionist. There was a military rule in Israel from 1949 until 1966 uh, over these Palestinian Arab citizens. So in those respects, um, Israel is certainly not a democracy as we understand the term. Doug. We were talking earlier as well, you and I, about uh, the, the situation in Israel and, and what a lot of people are ignorant about. And, and, and we were also talking about how, um, you know, it does make a difference in Israel if you're a Palestinian who is Muslim or if you're a Palestinian who is Christian. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think there is such a interest and why do you think we're, we're looking at Israel now and being the way we are with Israel? Is it all based in our Christian script? Is that what, is that what it's all about, or is there something more to it than that? <clears throat> well, it, there is a look at it that you have from two different angles from the Christian aspect. There's the evangelical way of looking at it, where they bring in the Old Testament and look upon Israel now as the is, Israelites of old come back. Mm -hmm. which is not necessarily true, we realize. Uh, but then there is another Christian aspect of looking at this from what they, you might call the mainland Christians, uh, who are more well aware of what's going on over there from a human rights legal standpoint. Uh, but really, I don't see much difference in the way Israel treats Palestinian uh, Christian Israeli citizens or the way Israel treats Palestinian Muslim Israeli citizens. Uh, both of them, as Joel mentioned, are, you might even say, third and fourth class citizens, because uh, I think Joel would probably... I've heard even lower than that, right, Joel? Yeah. Well, the, usually the way people classify this is that Jews of European descent sure. are the elite. Yes. Jews who are coming from countries of the Middle East are second-class citizens, right. even though they nominally have full citizenship rights. Yes. And then the Arab citizens uh, are uh, third on the totem pole. War, well, war has been raging on. You know, you hear, I, I hear a lot of people when you're discussing what's going on in the Middle East. They say things like, well, these people have been fighting amongst themselves for thousands of years. You know, why don't they just kill themselves off? We'd all be happier. Yes. Really, really, though, it's, I mean, even though wars have raged on between Israel and, and everything, and, and this has been, I mean, wars rage on with every country. 
This is relatively new, am I correct? Absolutely. And, yeah. and could you uh, explain that, how it's relatively new? Well, I'd say it really started taking hold after World War I, uh, but it even started a little bit before that, as Joel will, uh, you know, assent to, I suppose, is there was a Zionist conference in 1897 in, in Basel, Switzerland, mm -hmm. where the, the Jewish Zionists got together and came up with uh, the goal of Palestine as they, what they wanted to turn into a Jewish homeland. From there, I don't see any retreat from that. They've, they've been pushing for getting that whole land as Israel to begin with. Even to today, they still continue to take more Palestinian land through various means, mostly through settlement expansion and uh, extending this wall fence system that every day takes more Palestinian land. To me, this is basically what it's all about. So I, I always tell politicians, if you'll just enforce Resolution 242, which calls Israel to go back to the 1967 borders, this war would be over tomorrow. Would you agree with that? Yes and no. Um, yes, for the most part, uh, a majority of the Palestinians have clearly, and over the course of many years, um, indicated that if they were allowed to establish a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip with its capital at East Jerusalem, um, they would be prepared to uh, sign a peace treaty with Israel, recognize Israel, um, and so on. But uh, there have been some important changes since uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization accepted those principles uh, officially uh, in 1988, but practically speaking even before that. Uh, first, um, Hamas is now the dominant force in Palestinian politics. Uh, and their charter calls for the annihilation of the state of Israel. Now, I've just written an op-ed on TomPayne.com a few days ago in which I argue that even though they say that, it doesn't mean that it's not possible to negotiate with That's Hamas, right. and that might not be their actual immediate uh, objective or item on their uh, agenda. But ideologically, they are committed to it. Uh, now, most Palestinians who voted for them don't, in fact, believe that, and that's not why they won the recent Palestinian Legislative Council election. But that's an, uh, a, a sentiment that's out there now in a way that uh, it was not when the dominant forces on both sides in Israel and Palestine were secular. Second factor is that the question of the right to return for Palestinian refugees has now been raised in a very big way. Uh, it was not raised during the years of the Oslo process because uh, the Israelis didn't want it raised and the Palestinians agreed to kick it under the rug. Um, but it's one of the reasons that the Oslo process failed. So the question is, uh, do the Palestinians who uh, were forced to leave Israel, in large measure they were forced to leave, as some of them left of their own free will, um, in 1948, uh, do those Palestinians who left that territory that became the state of Israel uh, have the right to return? Um, and their descendants, of course, which we're talking now about four or five million people, perhaps. Uh, international law, international humanitarian practice, and many resolutions of the United Nations say, yes, they do have the right to return. Now, practically speaking, there are indications that most would not want to return. Uh, especially if they understood that they're going to live in the state of Israel as opposed to a Palestinian state. Um, so there's a way to recognize the right without all four million coming back. But Israel is completely against even recognizing the right uh, as, a, as a principle because essentially recognizing that right means that the state of Israel was established on the ruins of Palestinian society, which it was. That's just historical fact. But that now becomes a very complicated question that uh, it's an obstacle that didn't exist, say, five, eight years ago. I think that what we, <clears throat> and, as, and as we've uh, probably gone over many times before we even did this segment, we were talking about the, I guess you could say, educating the masses on what's really happening, and that's what we're attempting to do today, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to get to more. We're going to go to a, uh, a roll-in right now. We're going to go into a, a segment, a pro-Lebanon rally, that was held here recently, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to we're going to show what's been going on, what people have been doing. In the meantime, being act activated and actually speaking their minds about it. But in the meantime, we're going to come back and talk more about maybe some of the things that we don't know 
about what's going on and some of the things that we're kind of told to stick to the script or stick to the agenda. Sure. And we'll be back with more right here on Mattisell TV. It's time for us to get mad as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore. Yay, and that was Greg Pallas reporting to us this from Portland, Oregon. This is Greg Pallas reporting for Mad as Hell TV. Britain is just unbelievable, brothers and sisters. We ask negotiations should commence immediately. Why killing all the civilians? It, as one United Nations speaker said, it's a really funny war, or a self-defense war, I would say, that there is more children being killed than combatants. That is ridiculous. Collective punishment is a war crime. What happened today in Ghana is a war crime. And if you don't stop the war crime, you will be complicit of crimes. Cease fire now! 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 slaughter of the innocence that's going on in uh, Lebanon, Israel, and, and Palestine t today. And who do you represent here today? The Ainsworth United Church of Christ. This is what we should not have is war. Brothers and sisters, which is all over the world, should come together. And that's why I'm here. It's standing for the brothers and sisters that's in, in, in Israel and all over the world for peace. Sign says, Lebanon, Israel's Poland. So I think uh, Israel's being given a free pass to uh, invade Lebanon and uh, basically destroy as much of them as they want. The United States could stop it in five minutes. They could just say, hey, the $100 billion we've given you in the last 40 years, $5 billion a year, we're going to stop unless you stop. So it would take one word from Bush to stop this. I'm here in full support of, of the people of Lebanon, and I'm, I'm very much against this invasion of of uh, Lebanon by the Israelis, and I think it should stop, the killing should stop, the invasion should stop, and peace should start, negotiations should start. We should stop funding this terrorist war. Hey, we got your sign in there. Spells out P-E-A-C-E. -E. What does that spell? Peace. Okay, tell me why you're here today. Peace. Oh, peace. Okay, and you? It spells peace. Well, I think that uh, that Israel needs to get out of Lebanon, and, and uh, we need peace. We need peace all over the Middle East, and that's why I'm here. It's just really important. Yeah, the main reason I'm here is I believe that the Bush administration's policy have destabilized the Middle East and has started all this, and they want World War III, World War IV, whatever you want to call it, because they make big money off the military-industrial complex which Eisenhower warned us against. And we got to stop it because just as we went through in the Cold War, this could cause a huge nuclear holocaust. And it'd be bad for everybody in the world. I'm from Iran originally. Well, the regular citizenry in Lebanon have shown that they are not believing uh, the uh, allegation that this was a plot by Iranians or by Hezbollah on their own. It shows that there is a plan not to allow any any uh, democracy really take, take foot in the Middle East on its own. It should be a, uh, a mouthpiece for Israel and for American aggression. Are you from Lebanon or Palestine? Yes, Lebanon. From Lebanon? Mm -hmm. Do you still have family down there? I do, yes. All my family is here. I am, I am. It's not about supporting Hezbollah or supporting Hamas. Like, you know, if you have, if you live in, um, if you live in at your home and somebody kicks you from your home, I mean, how is it um, that it's, 
how is it like um, that this is justice you know like people feel that you they have to defend their lands or they they have to defend to live peacefully in their country you know that's that's how we feel you know it's, but this administra administration thinks otherwise and i hope that one day that they change their mind, you know. My name is Carol. This is Riva. This is Rachel. We are members of Jews for Global Justice. We want to stop to it all. We want to cease fire. Uh, the Israelis are shooting us all in the foot by murdering human beings in the south of Lebanon now. And we, we stand for ceasefire and end the occupation and start to make peace because we're not going to live together any longer if we don't. End the occupation now! End the occupation now! Demand a ceasefire now! Demand a ceasefire now! End the occupation now! End the occupation now! Demand a ceasefire now! Demand a ceasefire now! We're back with uh, Doug Wilbanks and also with uh, Joel Benin, uh, both distinguished gentlemen here today to talk about what's going on in the Middle East. Of course, uh, a lot of people have their opinions, very strong opinions about what's going on here, and it's all wrapped up in what I call the agenda or the script. If you go off script, immediately people criticize you, mm -hmm. which brings us to the, the comment that I talked about earlier and I want to talk about with you first. Uh, I want to talk about with you, Doug, is the, uh, the word anti-Semite. Now, a lot of people have been throwing that word around. It's been thrown around a lot. What would you say an anti-Semite is? Well, I think there's two aspects to it. Uh, technically, an anti-Semite is against anybody who speaks a Semitic type of language. But a common usage for a number of years now has been anyone who hates uh, Jews. Uh, now it's even been changed a little bit more. I hear it's, it's, it's used against by Jews against anyone who hates, who they, they dislike. You, if they dislike you, you're called an anti-Semite, whether you're an anti-Semite or not. I have been called an anti-Semite. Uh, Joel, what about you? What about anti-Semitism? I mean, isn't anti-Semitism a hatred of anything Middle Eastern or anything from that area? Well, it, the racial theory on which it's based presumes that people who speak a Semitic language are racially from the same stock. That's been proven to be false, but the theory then would uh, mean that if you're an anti-Semite, you don't like Arabs, you don't like Jews, uh, so on. But as Doug said, for all practical purposes for the last half century and more, um, certainly since the rise of uh, Nazism in, in Germany, um, it's meant hatred of Jews. Do you think the anti-Semitism uh, I guess you could say uh, the anti-Semitism uh, being thrown around, do you think that it's been overused? It certainly has been. It's a very unhealthy <clears throat> thing. Um, very typically, uh, leaders of those organizations that uh, purport to represent the American Jewish community uh, say that any criticism of Israeli policy is tantamount to anti-Semitism, that anti-Zionism is the same as anti-Semitism. Um, I think I've been called an anti-Semite, too. Um, so uh, when you use a word in an inaccurate and loose way like that, you cheapen it and you uh, allow people to uh, forget that there is real anti-Semitism in the world, which should be denounced by good people everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's like crying wolf. Exactly. And I think a lot of people have been, I guess... It kind of jades you a bit, especially when you're watching television and you hear about Mel Gibson. It's like they're still talking about Mel Gibson and what he said. Now, would you say that saying what he said about police officer being drunk, would that make him an anti-Semite? Yeah, I think so. You think I so? I mean, I don't think just because he said that. I, but just the, some of the things he's done in his father. The film yeah, and the father and right. the whole history. Yeah, I think it's fair to say Mel Gibson is an anti-Semite. And, and I've said before, and, and, and I think, you know, Doug, we were talking too about the Christian view of of mm -hmm. some of the things that we've seen as far as uh, the Passion of the Christ and, mm -hmm. and all that, what it was meant to be done. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, oh, what a great film. But what they're really ask, actually doing is they're espousing this hatred. And they're trying to, I believe that there's some agenda other than the script that's trying to generate a, a new type of hatred towards the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And in, in the same process, we use the excuses. I mean, it's the same reason why, I guess I could ask, 
I guess I could ask you, Joel. If you are saying that you are uh, sympathetic to Lebanon, does that make you sympathetic to Hezbollah, to Hamas? Not necessarily, no. Um, but why are they saying that then? Why, why do we have all these pundits saying, look, if you're saying what you're saying, then you must be on Hamas's or Hezbollah's side. Is that a political move? Well, it's, first of all, the politics of the Middle East are very, very complex. There are 18 different recognized religious communities in Lebanon. Politics is fragmented historically uh, according to those communities. Some of the communities, like the Lebanese Shia, are actually split, and there are two political parties that represent them. Uh, Hezbollah is one, Amal is another. I mean, that kind of detail is way, way beyond what most uh, network news people know and can even present on the TV, and it's far beyond what average Americans know. So um, people want it in sound bites and shorthand and so on, and so that's what they're given. And the same is true in Palestine. Uh, even though Hamas won the Legislative Council elections, there are several different political parties. Um, there are all set of different factors that go into why Hamas won, uh, even though most people actually don't believe in their program. Uh, That's very complicated, much easier to say these are terrorists, those are terrorists, we're against terrorism, we're good, they're terrorists, then we understand how the world is and it's easy. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they try to reduce it down to a black and white thing, good guys, bad guys, yeah. when in reality there's, we have to understand the big picture. Mm. And I think, you think, you think that has a lot to do with the Christian script. I know that, uh, you know, here we are, and, and I have talked about this. I'm, I'm getting down, and I'm getting to the point where I'm resolving that this war is a cult war. It's an occultic mm -hmm. war. It's based, well, there's economics, and there's, and there's oil, and there's all those things that everybody wants to get wrapped up in the political mm -hmm. aspects, but let's boil it down here. Mm -hmm. It's about Armageddon. It's about the end mm -hmm. of the world. It's about Israel fighting Arab. It's about, uh, it's about whether or not Jesus is returning tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Where do you go with that? Mm -hmm. My whole look at that is that basically it was British Christian Zionists that got this whole thing started. They joined in with the European Zionists and Russian Zionists, and, and they were very powerful over in England. They, they are the ones that got the Jews going back to Palestine. Today, American Christian Zionists are still behind this. They think they're doing God's work by getting the Jews back into their land so that Jesus will come sooner. But what these what these Christian Zionists, American Christian Zionists, don't realize is that I think they are going against God's will. You know, the scriptures were never, ever meant to be used to hurt other people. And right now, they're, by supporting Israel uh, against the, the Palestinians, and now even the Lebanese, uh, they seem to be oblivious to the fact that there's a lot of Palestinian Christians and a lot of Lebanese Christians that... Uh, these American Christians are fighting against. So, I mean, <laughs> what can you say? It, it's wrong. Uh, God does not want Jews to be used to fight his own adopted people, other Christians. So you got Christians fighting other Christians using Jews as the methodology. So this is totally wrong. So these American Christian Zionists are very off the wall. I, I would say they're very traitorous of, of uh, Christianity. Eschatology. We were talking about that a little bit too, Joel. Do the Israelis even buy into the eschatology crap that we're hearing about, you know, that the, this is supposed to happen, this is all foretold? I mean, let's take a look at the, the, the mosque, the Alaska mosque, the idea that if it blows up and if the, if the red heifer is born and all this other weird stuff that gets thrown into the mix. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that? Well, by and large, Israeli Jews are pretty secular, much mm -hmm. more secular uh, than American Jews, for example. Uh, but there is uh, a minority of uh, Orthodox religious Jews, probably around 20%. Uh, and within that minority, uh, there is a group uh, of, uh, what shall I say, uh, cultic type uh, folks. Uh, they have uh, set up a yeshiva, a religious seminary near the western wall in East Jerusalem. They are preparing for the coming of the Messiah. He hasn't yet come in the Jewish tradition at all. 
Uh, they are trying to figure out what they are going to do uh, when they find the red heifer and they can use the red heifer to purify everything. They are certainly imagining that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is somehow going to disappear and it's going to be replaced by the third temple. They are preparing themselves uh, to fulfill all the priestly functions that are laid out in the book of Leviticus. We're talking here about a few thousand Jews engaged in this, and a very large part of their funding comes from American Christian Zionists, the <laughs> folks that Doug was talking about. Mm -hmm. Doug, don't you think that's dangerous? Very dangerous. Uh, not only dangerous, but anti-God. God doesn't want people killing other people. You know, God made all human beings. Uh, he made all the different races. We, we aren't to hate other races. Uh, Christians are supposed to love everyone, including their enemies. But some Christians, for some reason or another, uh, like Bush himself, he says, let, let the Lebanese situation go on. Let's kill a few more Lebanese because uh, Israel has got to teach them a lesson. You don't mess with Israel. So let this killing go on. What kind of Christian tells people that people have to be killed, including Lebanese Christians. A Christian whose morality does not match our morality. That's yeah. what kind of Christian George W. Bush I'm is. I'm afraid so. And, and, and the problem here is that, as I said, we are America, not the Americult. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to generate this cult-like behavior in the country. And as I expressed to Joel early before we came into this program today, mm -hmm. I said, I don't think they wake up in Australia every day wondering if Jesus is going to return. I don't think they wake up in uh, South America mm -hmm. thinking that they're going to be the ones that are going to usher in the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Armageddon. Mm -hmm. But yet, I'm watching CNN covering the war, and immediately Paula Zahn comes on and she says, is this from the book of Revelation? Mm -hmm. Is this Armageddon? I mm -hmm. thought, CNN, cable news network. CBN, Christian Broadcast Network, mm -hmm. combined, right. and there we got right. it. We're right. no different than Al Jazeera. Yeah. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, I mean, that's what Al Jazeera would do, right, Joel? Uh, actually, Al Jazeera tends to have a more secular take than that <laughs> well, in its, okay. in its yeah, news corrected. programs. I mean, they do have religious <laughs> programs, but they right. don't talk about this stuff when they do the news. Right. Uh, I, I think you're right, and this has been the nature of the United States uh, almost since the country's founding. When the Puritans landed on Plymouth Rock, you know, uh, they were uh, read sermon by Increase Mather, I think it was, father, grandfather of Cotton Mather. I'm not an American historian, but one of the Mather people. One of the people, Mather brothers. Um, talking about establishing a new Jerusalem, a city on the hill. Uh, the, many of the people who established this country explicitly saw it in religious terms and saw it in terms of having a religious mission. One of my colleagues at Stanford, Hilton Obenzinger, who is a specialist in 19th century American literature, uh, Mark Twain and Herman Melville in particular, wrote an excellent book called America's Palestine. And he shows that throughout the 19th century, before there even was uh, a Jewish Zionist movement, uh, American culture was totally suffused with uh, attraction to Palestine, imagining that the United States is the new Palestine and a kind of relationship that uh, from the beginning is, is a kind of symbiotic relationship between uh, American settler colonialism, colonizing the West, uh, killing the Indians, which was also done in the name but of God many times. Doesn't that frighten you, though? It I mean, frightens me very much. Doesn't it frighten you that the, the, the New Jerusalem could very well mean destroying the Old Jerusalem? Absolutely. It's and terrifying. That, and that Israel, once again, will be under the gun, not only from those who hate them, but those who love them or say they love them. Yes. And you know what I'm saying here. Sure. No, I this mean, is why it's absolutely important uh, in the interests of the Israelis, in the interests of the Palestinians, of the Lebanese, and of all of the neighboring peoples, mm -hmm. that peace happen as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. That would really frost the Christian Zionists in this country to have peace over there. They'd shake their heads and, what's going on? We're supposed to have war over there. Well, you know, we're supposed to be welcoming war. Jesus tomorrow. Exactly. We're nudging Christ. I yeah. get so tired of saying, you know, how can these guys have the, I guess you could say, the, the fortitude mm -hmm. to say, we're going to nudge Jesus in the coming yeah. again. We're going to push, yeah. push, 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 push. Yeah. And, we're, and, and at the expense of everyone's lives. I know. And, 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 and as Joel had pointed out, I mean, the idea that it, this whole idea that the new Jerusalem has to be established mm -hmm. means that we have to get rid of the old Jerusalem before anything else happens. So that means mm -hmm. how many Israelis 
yeah. and Palestinians are going to have to die at the hands of, I mean, each other. And mm -hmm. if, if that doesn't do the trick, at the hands of us, yeah. we'd be marching them right back to the ovens again if, if, they, if we had our dithers, right? Well, if you, if you look at the course of history, uh, at least up until the 20th century, probably more people died because of religious fanaticism than any other cause. Mm -hmm. So whatever you think about what Christianity stands for or Islam stands for or Judaism stands for, and you can find uh, representatives of all three faiths who say, no, we have a religion of peace and yeah. so on. Um, and sure, why not? But on the other hand, uh, mm -hmm. lots and lots of people have been killed in the name of those religions. What we have here is we have uh, a lot of people who want to have a perfect world. They want a perfect world, beauty and peace and understanding. But what we have are a group of leaders yeah. that have screwed up viewpoints as to yes. how that perfect world is to be established. Yeah. And most of the time, it's at the expense of you and me. It's the expense of you, too, out there. Yeah. And the expense of those you love and, and those people who you work with who are Jewish or Muslim, yeah. black, white, whatever. And this is where you need to stop. This yeah. is where you need to understand that... A lot of the time, you are ignorant to what is happening, and the only thing you're getting is the blather that comes straight from the television. Mm -hmm. Why do they call it programming? Mm -hmm. Because they're programming you to believe certain things. As Joel pointed out, it's a soundbite. Most of it is a soundbite, and there is, it's a soundbite that keeps you on script. Well, here's the deal. It's time for you to get off script. Mm -hmm. It's time for you to get mad as hell, and it's time for you to figure out and learn before you speak. I was, quite frankly, a little hesitant because I know nothing about Israeli politics. And thank heaven, I have two great gentlemen on this program who I'd like to thank for being on here. Thank Doug, thank you so much for being on this program today. And Joel, thank you so much. I know you're, you're, you're heading off to Cairo. I am. I'm going to be the director of the Middle East Study Center at the American University in Cairo, and I leave on Wednesday. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on this program. And be sure and, and keep it here on Mattisell TV and keep watching. Uh, Mattis LTV with more information. We thank you. Good night. Under a foreign sky My fate awaits me There but for God go I Do not forsake me I am a boy Full of promise Full of free Joy is dead and done. I am gone. Before the Western Sea, my home was in the valley. There with my family. called my mother look to me her fine strong son and now the joy is dead and done I was a boy